Hey guys, welcome back to day three of the World Parkinson Congress. I am really excited to see you. Today was, um, not going to lie, it was a little bit of a slower day, but um, we mixed it up and actually I'm recording from Burnside Brewery off of Burnside Street in Portland and I have a few awesome uh, special guests with me today at the table, so I'm going to save that surprise for you um, here in a little bit. But um, today was all about living well with Parkinson's. We talked a little bit about gastroparesis and some intestinal um, issues that we might have some solutions for. Um, we went to a, a apathy seminar, um, which I promise to not bore you to death with the apathy um, highlights. And um, our special guests here have a few thoughts about other topics that they've learned about while they're at the World Parkinson Congress. So as I see people kind of trickling in here, um, I will just go ahead and introduce myself. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Sarah King. I am a physical therapist that owns a Parkinson's specialized practice in Austin, Texas. Um, I work with people on how to put together a Parkinson's plan and get their life back on track after being di diagnosed with Parkinson's. Um, so today was actually really special because some of the people that I really look at as role models in the Parkinson's community spoke this morning, and um, like Tim Haig and Brian Grant and Linda Olson, um, and told their story about being diagnosed, and I think you guys are going to really enjoy their story. So, um, hi, Hi, hello, Sarah. Is it Cyril and Carol? Oh, from Saskatchewan. Oh, we have a special guest for you. Canada in the house. I've got a special guest for you here in a minute. Um, okay, so I will just go ahead and jump right in. Um, I guess before I start, I do want to let you guys know that on Monday, when um, we get back from World Parkinson Congress, I'll be opening enrollment to my uh, five-week online Parkinson's booster program, which is an exercise program that you can do from home um, that's tailored to Parkinson's symptoms, complete support from um, Invigorate's team, and um, we're going to launch that on Monday. So if you want some type of home exercise uh, answer uh, that's Parkinson's specific, uh, you can go to invigoratept.com slash booster and find out more there. So I'm sorry there's a gnat in my face here. Hi, Mark. Hi, Patty. Thanks for coming back. I know you guys were here. And Sharon, you guys were here yesterday. I appreciate it. So, all right, we're going to talk um, about living well with Parkinson's. And there's a gnat that won't leave me alone. Okay. And so the, the speakers at the Living Well with Parkinson's event were some names that you probably recognize, like Linda Olson, Brian Grant, and Tim Haig. Um, if you don't know any of those three, I will tell you a little bit about them, but they have some really awesome inspirational quotes that they were talking about just going through being diagnosed and what their outlook is now um, and how to really take the control back into your own hands and um, just, you know, put together your plan and what um, figure out what you can do to make your life the best that it can be despite your diagnosis. So Linda Olson was 29 when she was hit by a train. Um, she was in a car accident, car versus train accident, and actually had an amputation of one of her arms and both of her legs. And um, I think 20 years later, she was then diagnosed with Parkinson's. And so she's had two times in her life where she has felt like she has hit absolute rock bottom um, and she's bounced back from it. And her message was incredibly powerful. Um, you know, her very simple message was keep going. Um, you get into the situation where you think um, your life is over, but really it's just the beginning of a new one. Yes, maybe a little bit different, but um, her message was really if she can do it, you can do it. And um, just know that there are always things that could be worse, um, but there are plenty of things that you can do to make your life better um, and just keep going. So. Next up, we saw Brian Grant, which some of you probably know from the Power Through Project. Um, he is an NBA player, ex-NBA player. He was diagnosed at age 36 with Parkinson's, and he actually started with a naturopath approach, and he lives in Portland, um, and he slowly adapted his life, and he ended up going on Parkinson's medications, but his message is all about exercise and powering through. Um, and his, his quote that he said today was, um, it, I'm walking through life um, next door or next to Parkinson's instead of watching Parkinson's lead me through my life. And, um, you know, you, 
as an athlete, he was always able to fix things, but Michael J. Fox called him and said, you know, uh, you're going to have to leave your vanity at the door and just um, be very humble about what you can achieve and know that um, everyone else is here to pick you up and um, to, to get a new team around you and, um, you know, really understand that it's not what others think about you, it's about what you think about yourself. So um, stop thinking about what other people are thinking about you and instead just focus on what you can do and go from there. Okay, so Tim Haig was next and he was the first winner of the Amazing Race Canada. Um, his son, Tim, so it was the Tims, um, won the Amazing Race Canada. Another shout out to Canada at this table. Um, and his message was, you can do more than you think you can. You just have to be willing to try. And he's all about staying in the race and living your absolute best. I got some thumbs up, so we must have some Canadians in the house here. Um, and he really talked about contentment, which he defines as an emotional state of satisfaction drawn from being at ease with your situation. And I understand that being di diagnosed with Parkinson's, it's hard to be content in that moment. Um, but his message was really look at your life now as it is and figure out what you can do to be happy and to grow, even if you're in this new situation. So these three people really um, started the, the conference off really strong today and really set in motion um, an awesome feeling of empowerment and, um, you know, connection with others and really just focusing on what you can do to be the best that you can be. So we were really flying high this morning when we went to see these speakers and then we left and we were going to see the sleep seminar all about sleep and Parkinson's. Y'all know how much I love to talk about sleep and we actually got locked out. It was full. So if you're tuning in hoping to hear about sleep and Parkinson's, everyone that I know got locked out of that event. So if I get some updates on sleep and Parkinson's, um, we'll definitely have another session. But instead, we went next door to a lecture about GI distress um, and the challenges that people face with their gastrointestinal tract. So we're really shifting gears here. But I think that um, the questions that I get about constipation and drooling um, and nausea um, were all talked about in this event. And so I'm not gonna go through word by word, but I will hit some of the major symptoms that um, a lot of people ask me about and help um, need help kind of addressing. So drooling is a big thing in Parkinson's, and a majority of people start with it just at night, um, and then it worsens over time. And it can be um, really embarrassing. I know that a lot of people who I see, um, it's just something that they're really anxious about having, especially in public places, around people that they know. Um, and so it can be caused by a variety of uh, reasons, mainly, um, you know, you're probably in a poor posture, head's coming forward, um, sometimes the mouth doesn't close fully, you're not swallowing as often as you, or as, um, as often or as strongly as you could be. And so some of the practical tips that I took away from that one, which some of you probably do already, is um, you can suck on gum or hard candy to help you initiate that swallow reflex every once in a while um, and kind of override that um, lack of swallowing reflex that you have. Um, another option that I didn't realize was so predominant for drooling is actually Botox injections in the jaw um, and they can last, um, the effects of them are actually very positive and they can last for about three to four months. So that might be something worth investigating with your neurologist or your movement disorder specialist, um, getting injections um, around the salivary glands to help um, eliminate the drooling or minimize it as much as you can um, could be an effective uh, treatment for you. And also, um, I have to give a shout out, of course, if you're having drooling or having issues with um, swallowing, uh, you also want to see a speech language pathologist who can help you with some techniques to help you um, clear that up a little bit more. So big love to my speech therapist out there. Okay, so I am going to go on to constipation because I know yesterday y'all really asked me a lot about constipation and um, so I'm going to keep going on the poo discussion here. Okay, so constipation can have three reasons. You can either have a really poor diet, 
um, but regular gut motility, which means that your your belly is functioning the way that it should, but your diet isn't allowing you to be frequent um, or have the right kind of bowel movements that you want. So the way that you start with constipation is you assume that it's just your diet and change your diet first, um, get lots of fiber, fluids, activity, and see if that will clear it up. If it's still giving you issues, then you may be having some type of slow motility in your gut. And if that's the case, then um, you know slow motility in your gut is the same as slow walking when um, you know with your legs. It comes from a similar source. So your dopamine, dopaminergic uh, medications should be able to help with that, um, and that should help with the changes in your diet um, to help move things along and get them going. But if you have issues with this third um, kind of combination of events, where you are, it's like a tube of toothpaste. Um, in order for toothpaste to come out of the tube, you have to take the screw off and you have to squeeze the tube. This is not my analogy, this was a speaker's analogy today. So sometimes when you have Parkinson's, the cap doesn't come off because you don't relax your anal sphincter. And um, so if you're squeezing the tube of toothpaste with the cap still on, um, then you can see why it would feel like um, nothing is coming out. So there's actually biofeedback techniques that you can use, um, or a, a gastroenterologist can train you to help you re-coordinate your muscles, your abdominal muscles and your, um, your anal sphincter. And so don't watch this over dinner because obviously you won't be hungry anymore. But um, in all seriousness, if that feels like you, if you feel like um, you know, you're know you just trying to have a bowel movement and it just feels like it's stuck and nothing's happening, um, you may talk to your gastroenterologist about biofeedback training to help you clear that up. And also the Squatty Potty got a major shout out yesterday. Um, I love the Squatty Potty. It brings your feet up um, higher so that you actually, your alignment is good so that gravity can help you eliminate. So that's Squatty Potty, just stick it in Google and you'll find um, everything you wanted to know and more about the Squatty Potty. Okay, so for our last topic, um, we went to a conference about apathy or a seminar about apathy. And this is actually pretty interesting to me, um, parts of it, because apathy is actually something that I hear from a lot of my clients. And, um, you know, just like that lack of motivation, they can't get going, they just don't feel like they want to do anything, even if it was the things that they were doing before. And so a highlight was talking about how apathy actually isn't depression. It's not the same thing, um, but the symptoms can overlap. And the most frequent complaint is of fatigue, and that's actually apathy, but almost in disguise. So um, you either feel, if you're apathetic, if you actually have true apathy, you feel sleepy or you feel like you have decreased energy. And this can be, like I said, apathy kind of um, working in the uh, background against you, but it's, it's definitely different than depression. I think that's important for you to know. So coping with apathy can be multifactorial. Obviously, you know how big of a component um, eating right and making sure you're getting good nutrient-filled foods can help you with your energy levels. But beyond that, it's just really important for you and your care partner to know that apathy is a symptom of Parkinson's um, and that it's not done on purpose. Um, you know, I think that patients often feel guilty about feeling apathetic um, or caregivers might get frustrated. So, um, you know, just knowing that it's not... Um, it's not done on purpose and just being more caring and more loving. Also, it's okay if you're a caregiver and your, your partner has apathy, it's okay to push them. I actually do, you know, you're, I know you might feel guilty about pushing them and always quote unquote feeling like the nag, but it actually helps them stay on track and giving them a schedule, or if you're someone who has Parkinson's, setting your schedule, um, it can help you actually regulate your mood, getting into a schedule um, getting into a pattern, and that can actually help to curb the apathetic symptoms quite a bit. So, also, apathy can fluctuate as your medications wear on and off. So if you feel like as you come into your off period, you're also feeling apathetic and fatigued and whatnot, that can just be a byproduct of your fluctuations in your medication. So, 
like I said, we didn't get to see quite as many things today, but I do have two special guests here with me. Um, one is from Arizona and one is from Canada. They are fellow Parkinson's physical therapists. And I am going to put them on. They're going to share a little bit about who they are, where they're from, um, what they do. And then I asked them to share a quick tidbit about their favorite, most um, informative thing that they've learned at the World Parkinson Congress thus far. Um, so I love these ladies, and I think you guys will too. So I'm going to turn it over to our first guest. Ooh, we're going this way. Hi guys, can you hear me okay? Hopefully, thumbs up. Hi everyone, so I'm so excited to be here with you today and be here with Sarah and Jen at the conference. We've had a great time so far. Uh, my name's Naomi, I'm a physiotherapist in Vancouver, BC, um, and I run NeuroFit. I founded NeuroFit BC, it's a company where I treat 100% Parkinson's patients and I run group exercise classes and also do one-on-one -on -one treatments for people who use Parkinson's. And so. We're all passionate about the same things here, which is great. So I'm so excited to be here with these ladies. Um, and excited to be here with you today. So what I want to talk to you a little bit about today is just what I saw this morning um, in the sessions and some of kind of the key points that came out of that and have really stuck with me over the, the day so far. So this morning was a talk all about genetics and Parkinson's. And <laughs> some of that goes straight over our heads. But there were some really interesting points in there. And one of the really interesting things that they spoke about um, was a medical professional, his name is Jason Karlowich, and he spoke about, can you guys hear me? Yeah? A little louder. My voice can always go louder, I'm good at that. So he spoke about today how um, people can get their, their genomes tested. So you can go and get your genomes tested to find out if you, you know, have certain predisposing factors for Parkinson's. You can get scans to say, you know, whether or not you may have amyloid plaques in your brain, which can be a kind of signal that you might be more predisposed to having things like Alzheimer's or dementia. So the really interesting point that came out of this whole discussion was that they did research and what they showed is they compared two groups. So one group had these plaques that kind of predisposed them to having cognitive issues and they knew about it. So they knew they had the, the kind of predisposition to these plaques. The other group also had these plaques, but they didn't know it. So they compared these two groups and they gave them a memory test. And what they found is the group who had the knowledge about these plaques in their brain did worse on the memory test, and the group that didn't know did the same as their peers. Now these groups technically, you know, over the large amount of data that they tested should have been fairly similar. They both were in the same stages. They hadn't actually developed any cognitive issues yet. They were just predisposed to it. So it's a really, I found it a really kind of key salient point to say that, you know, how you think about yourself and your self-image and what you project about your symptoms and, you know, what you can and can't do has a big effect on what you actually can and can't do. So, you know, in our world, if we relate this to exercise and activity, I hear all the time, you know, I can't do that. I have Parkinson's. And they say, well, try it. Let's give it a try. Let's see if you can do it. And more often than not, they can. You know, I can't get up and down off the ground. Well, you haven't done it in a while, you know, let's give it a try. And if you go in there saying, you know, I can do this or I can at least try and do it, then you might actually have better success just from going in with that attitude than saying, you know, I, I can't do this or, you know, I'm predisposed to this, so I think I'm going to do worse at it. So the research shows that it actually does have a significant effect on what your actual outcomes are. And I think that's really important for exercise and for, you know, social interactions and things like that. The other thing that he mentioned that was important was, you know, sometimes these people didn't want to tell people the results of their genetic testing because they were afraid that society would change the way they look at them and it's a, them you know and it's a it's a very valid concern but what he said is that you know whether or not you get these tests done that surrounding yourself with a group of people who will understand you and who you believe will value you no matter what those results are and no matter what you have going on um, is is extremely valuable so that was you know the key point from him and it really hit home and one of my clients who is here from Vancouver um, actually came up to me after and said, you know, that's me. I'm terrified of getting cognitive decline, and because of that, I don't do as much as I, I could. I, you know, it holds me back. And so that was, it was just a really amazing point to think about that, you know, 
how you perceive yourself and what you perceive that you can do has a big impact on what you actually can do. So that's one of the big points that I want to leave you guys with. Um, I also went to the power session today, which was amazing and got me even more excited about power. You know, we're all power certified therapists here. And if you don't know what power is, it stands for Parkinson's Wellness Recovery. And we just had a great time doing these fun dynamic moves. And the focus today was cognition. So building cognition into your power program. And that's been kind of a key focus of lots of the things that we've done today and yesterday, which is to say that you know, your exercises should include cognition and cognitive challenges, even if you don't have any cognitive limitations at this point. It's the same as exercise, right? You want to train your brain and, and improve and, and build up that system as much as you can. So, you know, I know all of us Parkinson's PTs like to build it into our program, and, and it's a really key, important piece. So if you are seeing a, a physio or anyone or you're doing exercise on your own, just make sure that that's a component of it. You know, the Power website can give you ideas. Sarah has great ideas and has great ideas. So... You know, go to these different websites and check them out and just see, you know, what you can be doing to incorporate that into your program. So that's all I have to today. Big shout out for Canada. If you want to see, you know, what I do, you can go to my website. It's www.neurofitbc.com. Um, and again, I'm just so excited to be at a place where, you know, we get to network and, and meet such amazing people who are doing the same things all over the world. So very exciting. And I hope you guys are all getting great insight about what's happening here. Um, and I'm going to pass it along to Jen, who's going to tell you more. Okay, good, yeah. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? It's Jennifer Anderson. I'm from Root Physical Therapy. We are located. Sarah's telling me a little louder. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. I'm Jennifer Anderson. I'm from Root Physical Therapy. Um, we are located in Arizona. We cover the full Phoenix Valley. I just brought on another physical therapist, so we're really excited about that. And we also have speech therapy services, so if you know anybody in Arizona that would benefit, send them our way. Um, so like Naomi mentioned too, I'm so happy to be here with Sarah. She and I actually went to undergraduate together, so we've been friends a long time. Um, we've been linked up with Naomi for a while now too, so we're really excited to meet her and get to connect with her um, and just share, share this experience together. So today, um, I just wanted to tell you guys a little bit actually about my favorite part of the conference so far, which was from yesterday, um, and that topic was freezing of gait. So do any of you guys, I'm going to look for Sarah to see if we get some thumbs up. Do any of you guys have freezing um, that are watching? So we we know already, um, but they, they brought out the statistic that 50% of people with Parkinson's have freezing of gait. So it's very, very common. So I'm guessing that some, at least some of you guys out there freeze. Um, and I really liked the way they phrased the description of it as a functional decoupling of the brain, which I thought was really good, um, basically saying that the motor and the cognitive tracks uh, decouple from each other when people freeze, which totally makes sense. And they used an even better example of a funnel. So if you think of a funnel um, and what happens when you freeze, if you freeze, is that you probably um, are getting caught up with your thoughts. So they said the funnel, you know, you're trying to get your thoughts, your movement, um, and then worrying maybe about all, both of those things at the same time, um, go into the funnel, and then the funnel gets backed up, and then you freeze. So what the tendency is that people with Parkinson's um, go toward their thoughts first, and so that's why the movement stops. That's why you freeze. Um, and one of the things they talked about that I was a learning point for me, for sure, was uh, the predictors of freezers. So even if you're not freezing yet, uh, there were a few key points that uh, if, you know, if you experience these things, then you're likely to be a freezer. And those were lower limb symptoms, which that one's pretty obvious. You know, if you're having lower limb uh, symptoms, you're likely to be a freezer. But also, if you have cardiovascular symptoms, that could be indicative of freezing. Uh, if you have anxiety, I think that one's also pretty intuitive, but if you have anxiety, you could be likely to freeze. Cognitive deficits, um, sleep disorders, which was interesting. Also, if you have sleep deficits or disorder, um, you're more likely to be a freezer. And then, of course, if you have the non-tremor subtype of Parkinson's, you're likely to, more likely to be a freezer. Um, so then what I wanted to talk about, too, was um, treatment options. So 
Medication, you know, medication is very important, obviously, but I thought it was really cool that they brought out the fact that medication can also be detrimental to your movement. So levodopa isn't always the best option as far as movement for freezing. It's just something to be aware of. I'm not saying, of course, I'm not saying to stop taking your carbidopa, levodopa, stop taking your sediment. No, keep taking it. But just be aware that if you notice it, you know, if you increase your medication and your freezing increases, that's just a, a conversation to have with your physician. So. Um, that was one thing that can get worse. They showed an example. Also, DBS um, is a great treatment option, but can also um, increase your likelihood of freezing. So just things to be aware of. Um, but as far as physical therapy implication goes, because Sarah, Naomi, and I are all physical therapists, and um, that's our area of expertise, treatment options would be uh, training and backward walking, for one, is, is very, very good. Also, initiation of movement training, very good agility training. Um, and then I always teach the 4S method, and I believe Sarah teaches the 5S method, yeah. So they're basically the same thing. The 4S method is stop, stand, shift, and then step. So basically you're focusing on the motor component of your movement and, you know, focusing your thoughts on that one thing. And that's really the bottom line is to, you have to focus your attention into your movement. Um, so that was a great talk today on freezing. If you guys have more questions, you can ask any of us. Um, but if you want to follow Root, we would love to, to talk to you more. So it's www.rootphysicaltherapy.com. Um, sign up to get our emails and, um, yeah, just keep in touch. Back to Sarah. All right. Alrighty guys, well thanks for tuning in. I appreciate you guys stopping by and I also appreciate having our guests here today. We're in a new location with new friends and um, they've already started so I'm going to order my own <laughs> beverage and um, I will see you guys tomorrow but also in the meantime if you're interested in signing up for the booster program again I definitely would love to have you be part of our tribe um, it's www.invigoratept.com slash booster and um, it's completely online exercise program I would love for y'all to join it starts next week and we'll talk more about that later for sure but until then enjoy your evening um, we are going to socialize and have some food and I hope you guys do the same so have a great night. Bye, guys. So fun. It's fun. If I can finish. Just kidding. We can't finish. <laughs> We're still here. The PCA just okay. brought on. Thanks, guys. Bye, girls.